Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy false prophets and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor as the labor progresses the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes as we get closer to jesus return all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense all of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time jesus speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. I'm going to start with the mass shooting in the Manhunt in Maine. After a gunman opened fire at a bowling alley and a restaurant, the shelter-in-place order has expanded. People are urged to stay inside, lock their doors. We're hearing from some of the survivors this morning. I want to go back to Whit Johnson on the scene in Lewiston, Maine. Good morning, Whit. George, good morning to you. There are multiple crime scenes here in Lewiston and streets blocked off, including this one behind me just down the way. That's where it's believed this deadly rampage began at a bowling alley that was hosting an event for children. The killer then moving on to a local restaurant, opening fire there. And this morning, he remains on the run, leaving this tight-knit community on edge. Two active shooter locations, all available units. This morning, a massive manhunt underway for an armed and dangerous killer after a mass shooting in Maine's second largest city. We have an active shooter. We have multiple injuries. The first 911 call coming in around 7 p.m. from a local bowling alley hosting a youth night for kids bowling league. Authorities releasing these surveillance images showing the suspected gunman armed with a rifle where he began his killing spree. I was a balloon. I had my back turned to the door. And as soon as I turned and saw it, it was not a balloon. He was holding a weapon. The suspect then traveling about four miles to the second shooting scene at a local bar and restaurant. At least 16 people killed and dozens injured. It's all ages. It was all ages. Police have identified 40-year-old Robert Card as the person of interest. Sources telling ABC News he has a history of military service and is a firearms instructor and was treated at a mental health facility over the summer after allegedly saying he was hearing voices and threatened to shoot up a National Guard facility in Saco, Maine. If people see him, they should not approach Card or make contact with him in any way. Authorities discovering the suspect's white Subaru around 11.30 p.m., eight miles from the Lewiston crime scene. Overnight, we spoke with Megan Hutchinson and her 10-year-old daughter, Zoe, who were at the bowling alley. We barricaded in there, and another parent was in the room with me. She had a phone. She just, like, shocking. Like, it's something that you'd think would never happen. I never thought I'd grow up and get a bullet in my leg. Like, why do people do this? We need to answer the question. Why do mass shootings keep happening in America? What does this meaningless violence mean? Will it get worse and worse? As the time of Christ's return draws near, if we think that things are going to get better and that mankind will solve this problem for less violence, we are fooling ourselves. The Bible indicates otherwise. The simple answer to why do mass shootings keep happening in America is God is being expelled from the essence of American society. Through Supreme Court decisions starting in 1962, God is being expelled from America. 1962, 
Engel vs. Vital, The Removal of Prayer in Public Schools by the Supreme Court, 1963, Abington School District, First Shump, The Removal of Bible Reading in Public Schools by the Supreme Court, 1973, Roe vs. Wade, Legalized Abortions by the Supreme Court. Although Roe v. Wade was overturned by the Supreme Court on June 24, 2022, there have been over 60 million abortions in the United States. 2013, United States vs. Windsor. The Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. DOMA stated that one man should be married to one woman. DOMA is biblically supported according to Genesis 2.24, which says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. 2015, Oberfell vs. Hodges, the Supreme Court case that ruled in favor of same-sex marriages. Contrary to the Lord's commands, America has made it illegal to teach about God and to pray to Him in public schools. America has made it legal to murder unborn children and has legalized homosexuality in the form of God's sacred institution, marriage. Jeremiah 30.12 says, For thus says the Lord, Your affliction is incurable, your wound is severe. As a nation, I think America may have reached the point in time where God will no longer hear our prayers because our sin is incurable. Hosea 4.6 My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I also will forget your children. Last month, we reported an absolutely ghoulish scene. Two teens in Vegas purposely ran over a retired police chief. They made a snuff video out of it filming their stolen car, hitting the chief on a bike. They've been charged with murdering 64-year-old Andreas Probst. <laughs> Jesus Ayala and Jamir Keys were both minors at the time, but this week, they've been charged as adults. They're 16 and 18. They filmed their crime spree this summer, stealing three cars, burglarizing a home, and we just found out they mowed a second person down with the stolen car that day, who thankfully survived. They've pled not guilty to a ton of charges, showing no remorse, no shame. The two were laughing in court yesterday, even giving the dead man's family the finger. The chief's daughter was sickened. How can you sit there after taking a man's life and act like such an entitled <laughs> They really have no remorse that this is just a game to them. America's so worried about Hamas, we're already seeing monsters here. Already. In order to fully grasp their twisted mentality, you have to see what the 18-year-old said in the back of the squad car right after he was arrested. He taunted the officer and bragged he'd be out in a month. Is it really that serious? Yeah, it is. You should buy me something to beat. What? I, I, I say you should buy me something to beat. I like your gun, though. It's a P80 or what is it? 320? The SIG 320? You should let me have it. Yeah? Should, should I just hand it to you? It's reported stolen, you know. I'm not scared. You are. A hundred percent. You think this juvenile will do something? I'll be out like 30 days. Ah, oh, bitch. You might be out of juvie in 30 days and move over to an adult jail. Because that's how bad it is. Just the up. run. Slap on the face. We're breeding children who expect to walk away from a murder. Young men who have only experienced a slap on the wrist can't even imagine they'd do hard time for a homicide. The criminal justice system has never set a boundary. Neither has their school, neither has their family. The 16-year-old was in the foster system. His father, not around. The other teen has a long rap sheet in and out of juvie. His mother showed up at court. Father never showed up. Both kids, no dads, raised in the street, raised in the system. The two fathers have blood on their hands. The schools can't punish them because Obama said it's racist. And the justice system can't punish them because professors and prosecutors tell us they're already oppressed. And now a man's dead. But no one wants to talk about why, because it's racist. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Something is changing in our world. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, 
lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. One of the many signs that we are living in the last days is that men would be lovers of themselves, as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Every characteristic listed after men would be lovers of themselves illustrates what men do when they love themselves above God. When you jump down to verse 13, the Bible states, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It is very evident that evil is getting worse and deception is off the charts. Godlessness is now taking over all aspects of society. Joining me now, Randy Sutton, retired Las Vegas police lieutenant. Randy, my blood was boiling watching that video, and I know so many Americans watching this and thinking the family of that retired police chief having to watch that. No remorse from either of them. Can you imagine the family being in the courtroom and being in, in that close proximity with these two? Uh, you know, it, it's difficult for people to believe that evil exists in this world, Laura, and the reality is it does. The Bible's teaching on good versus evil leads to a challenging conclusion that every person is obligated to make a fundamental choice between the two. That choice is entirely determined by our response to God, who is both the definition of good and our Creator. That means either following His will or rebelling and choosing to sin. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it eternally. This means we either choose to accept God and His salvation or align ourselves against Him. While we may be imperfect and fallible, we cannot be neutral in our approach to good versus evil. We are either seeking the goodness of God or the selfishness of evil. The prophet Isaiah put it succinctly, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. When I look at these two, that's what I see. They are devoid of humanity. They are devoid of of, of, the, of the common traits of empathy, of compassion. It doesn't exist within them. They have become some type of mutation. And this is what we're growing in, in America now, because there is such a, a uh, empowering of criminality throughout this nation, where the lack of consequences is, is now the rule as opposed to the exception. And these two these two have, have absolutely no humanity within them. And here, here's the, 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 the harsh reality when it comes down to sentencing. Now, first of all, they're, go, they're being treated as adults. They're being, uh, they're being tried as adults. But because of the age of these two, the maximum sentence that they can receive is life with the possibility of parole. I wish the death sentence could be utilized in this case. Well, to that point, you know, there's another moment um, in the police car after the 17-year-old was arrested. Watch this. You should buy me something to eat. What? I, I, I said you should buy me something to eat. Something to eat? Why? No, I'm hungry. Randy, he said, you should buy me something to eat. There's a sense of entitlement. I don't want to, you know, treat them like they're <laughs> where they deserve to be analyzed. But in this case, there's a sense of entitlement. And you get the sense, you know, entitled because they're aggrieved that they can get whatever they want. They can get it for free. They can kill anyone they want. And they don't expect any consequences. It's a joke to them. It is a joke to them to hear them laughing and giggling like like the, the creatures that they are is is it sends a, a, a chill down your spine. Now, remember that they killed the second person that they hit. But they also hit another man on a, on, a, on a bicycle. In fact, they switched places. They each wanted a turn at trying to kill, kill someone. And the fact that they did it, there is no remorse, the callousness that they display. Um, here we have something that I, I, I don't even consider them human. I consider them mutations and something yeah. that, that we need to guard ourselves against. I just pray that they are never unleashed on humankind again. 
because once they have displayed this behavior, they're not going back. Anti-Semitism. Now, it's always bubbled under the surface, but now it's right out in the open. And today it was a nationwide walkout for Palestine at colleges and even some high schools across America. Now, participants called it a peace protest, but that's not how Hamas is interpreting it. For them, it's just another propaganda victory. Now, young minds in the United States are falling for this big lie that they're the real victims in this story. Well, a new Harvard-Harris poll asked respondents about their views in the United States on Hamas and Israel. Now, overall, 84% of respondents told pollsters they favored Israel, which um, is good, but 16% favored Hamas. Okay. But for those aged 18 to 24, only 52% expressed support with Israel and 48% sympathized with Hamas. Now, Newsweek summed it up this way. Yeah, that's right. Nearly half of young respondents said they side with a terrorist group that just earlier this month purposely targeted and slaughtered innocent civilians, including women, children, and infants, in a chilling and sadistic manner. Then there was this overlooked data point. The pollsters also asked, do you think that the attacks on Jews were genocidal in nature or not genocidal? 62% of those aged 80, 18 to 24 said yes, they were genocidal. But at the same time, the same age group was asked, do you think that Hamas's killing of 1,200 Israeli citizens in Israel can be justified by grievances of Palestinians, or is it not justified? A 51% majority said yes, the attacks were justified. Now, Phil Klein at National Review reacted this way. There are two ways to interpret this finding. One is to think there are millions of Americans who are okay with genocide against the Jews. Another explanation is that there are millions of people who don't know what genocidal actually means. Or as Sonny Corleone put it, once you go to college, you get stupid. You're really stupid. Now, brainwashed, privileged youth taught by activists to be activists. From climate change, a la Greta Thunberg, to George Floyd, to the days and nights of rage. And last night, a few miles from our studio, students from George Washington University felt emboldened enough to broadcast their anti-Semitism. Now, this campus group called Students for Justice in Palestine projected messages onto the wall of a central building on campus that included glory to our martyrs and divest from Zionist genocide. Now, another slogan in the continuous loop was free Palestine from the river to the sea. Now, if you don't know that motto, it's a rallying cry for Hamas, and it's widely seen as calling for the annihilation of Israel. Now, could it have been a coincidence that the university building chosen by these students for their stunt is the Gelman Library, which was funded by a prominent Jewish American family? Mm, doubt it. Now, once made aware of what was happening, the university claims to have promptly told the students, bad on you, stop projecting those images, please. Well, the university responded with a carefully worded but rather tepid statement at first, at no point mentioning what was actually said in these hateful messages. But of course, after getting hit with a massive backlash, they finally admitted the phrases projected on the library themselves were anti-Semitic. Well, nice try on the cleanup, but the messages were allowed to flash onto the building for two hours. Now, why? How long do you think it would have taken the university to stop, I don't know, some Christian student group that was projecting giant images of Bible passages, maybe Leviticus? Five minutes, that thing would have been down? Well, that's about right. Now, understandably, Jewish students across the country feel like they're under siege. The sad truth is, unless huge numbers of wealthy families begin withholding donations to these universities, this situation is only going to get worse. And my message to parents tonight, why are you sending your sons and daughters and your hard-earned money for all that tuition dollars 
to colleges that don't just tolerate anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism, but that in some cases actively encourage both. Look what's happening at UC Berkeley, where students are reportedly getting extra credit for being extra stupid. According to screenshots, one professor is rewarding students for buying into their settler colonial occupation of Gaza charade. Students should demand extra credit, I think, for schooling this professor on the long history of Muslim conquest and colonialism beginning in the uh, seventh and eighth centuries. A um, professor might not be aware of that. Or, or what was it the Arab armies did in Central Asia and Africa, benevolent and justified? Yeah, ask your professors about that. Decades ago, the party of FDR and JFK made a deal with the devil when it abandoned its working class traditional roots and began to align itself with anti-American neo-Marxist radicals. Now, these people were well-funded and they were motivated by anti-Western grievance. And now these same people, a new generation, are demanding a clean break from Israel. They allowed their political identity to be infected by a vicious lie that America is racist, that our founders are racist, and that about half our country needs to essentially just die off because it's racist. But the real truth is the real evil is what they've welcomed into their own party. People think it's okay to bomb a hospital. President Biden, not all America's with you on this one. And you need to wake up and understand that. Do you think that Israel should just lay down their arms and not try to get the hostages out of Gaza? How can Israel have a ceasefire with terrorists whose entire mission is to wipe out their existence? Notice how the Democrats never really disassociate themselves from the likes of the squad. So why did the administration talk to its favorite House media organ today, Axios, bragging that they're getting Israel to delay going into Gaza? Well, here's one theory, to placate their party's fanatics. And then another telling moment from Biden earlier today. 24 U.S. troops have been injured during 10 drone or rocket attacks on bases in Iraq and three in Syria over the past week. Should Americans be worried that the war already is escalating? We have had troops in the region since 9-11 to go after ISIS and prevent its reemergence re re in, in both, anyway, in the region, having nothing to do with Israel at all. My warning to the Ayatollah was that if they continue to move against those troops, we will respond, and he should be prepared. It has nothing to do with Israel. Uh, nothing to do with Israel? Uh, you're thinking he can't be serious. Now, sure, troops have been injured before in Iranian-backed uh, attacks, including in 2020, but now Iran is sending us a message. Remain committed to Israel's safety, allow a Gaza invasion, and risk stoking a bigger regional war. So now is the time for searing clarity. But Biden, or more accurately, his handlers, undoubtedly see the domestic political repercussions as well. And in an election that will probably be close, they cannot afford to lose young voters, which are increasingly pro-Hamas voters. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians 6.12 for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. 
Turning overseas now to the war in Israel with Israeli troops poised on the Gaza border, the ground invasion is still on hold. In an address to the nation, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the war cabinet will decide when to move in. Meanwhile, with the fate of more than 200 hostages hanging in the balance, many are turning to prayer. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell brings us the story from Jerusalem. Overnight, the IDF conducted a raid into the northern Gaza Strip, striking a number of Hamas targets to prepare the battlefield for the next stage of combat. On the ground, the soldiers say they're ready. As far as why we're not operating, I don't know why exactly. There's rumors because of the cabinet, the prime minister, whoever, I don't care. As far as the military is concerned, we are ready, we are prepped, we have been training, and we've been overtraining, and we have been honing in our tactics, in my unit at least, and I can tell you, as far as we're concerned, we are more than ready to go in, to operate, and to get things done. There are reports Israel is delaying the ground invasion while the U.S. moves more resources into the region to deter a widening war. Wednesday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu addressed the nation. He said the time of the ground invasion will be determined by the war cabinet and explained what's at stake. We're concerned by one thing, saving the country, achieving victory. Our war against Hamas is a test for all of humanity. It's a fight between the Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas axis of evil and the forces of freedom and progress. Light will defeat darkness. In Lebanon, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah met with leaders of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Hamas, their first reported meeting since the start of the war. The Wall Street Journal also reported that as many as 500 Hamas terrorists trained inside Iran before the massacre on October 7th. In the meantime, the IDF continues to bomb Hamas targets in Gaza City. A Hamas spokesman says 6,000 Palestinians have been killed so far, a number President Joe Biden questions. I have no notion that Palestinians are telling the truth about how many people are killed. I'm sure innocents have been killed, and it's the price of waging a war, but I have no confidence in the number that the Palestinians are using. Biden also believes the Hamas attack was designed to disrupt peace in the Middle East. I'm convinced. One of the reasons Hamas attacked when they did, I have no proof of this, as my instinct tells me, is because of the progress we were making towards regional integration for Israel and regional integration overall. And we can't leave that work behind. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. As Israeli airstrikes flatten the Gaza Strip, and with pressure mounting on Israel to pause its reprisal attacks and allow more aid to reach Palestinian civilians, the Israeli military overnight carried out its first significant incursion into Gaza, sending in tanks from the Givati Brigade and special forces. The Israeli military released footage of the operation in northern Gaza, describing it as a targeted raid deep into Gaza. In a statement saying Israeli soldiers located and struck numerous terrorists and operated to prepare the battlefield. The troops withdrew after the mission. This was not Israel's much anticipated full scale invasion. Thousands of Israeli troops, many of them reservists, remain inside Israel, ringing Gaza. Last night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said a ground assault is coming and that only Israel will decide when and how to do it. Israel now appears to be testing the ground to judge Hamas's reaction and strength. Last night, President Biden defended Israel's right and obligation to attack Hamas after its militants killed more than 1,400 Israelis and took more than 200 hostages. But he added a note of caution. When this crisis is over, there has to be a vision of what comes next. And in our view, it has to be a two-state solution. God gives the most dire warning to the nations who would divide up his land, as we read in Joel 3, 1 and 2, and Zechariah 12, 8 and 9. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, 
I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations. They have also divided up my land. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The destruction from the most powerful hurricane to ever hit the Pacific coast of Mexico, Otis, slamming into the coast near a tourist haven as a Category 5 storm. Ginger has more. And Ginger, the way this particular hurricane yeah. intensified was startling. Truly, the models did terrible with it. And I don't say that. I don't admit mm. because most of the time they do very well. But I want you to watch you. the clock <laughs> as this monster approached. At 10 a.m. Tuesday, Otis is a tropical storm. Winds 70 miles per hour. By 10 p.m., winds are 160 miles per hour. So Otis went from a tropical storm to a Cat 5 in just 12 hours, which is something that only a handful of storms have done around the world since records began in the 1960s. This morning, the race to recovery as devastating new images surface from Acapulco, Mexico. They were lashed by an historic Category 5 hurricane. Hurricane Otis, the strongest on record to hit Mexico's Pacific coast with peak winds up to 165 miles per hour. Otis destroying this hotel, the walls and ceiling collapsing. The rooms flooded, mattresses and unhinged doors scattered across the floor. Hallways exposed and unsafe, forcing guests to shelter in the ballroom. And outside, the courtyard littered with debris. Neighborhoods submerged in water, including the base of the stadium. Mudslides and fallen trees spilling into major roads, cutting off vital access for vehicles. The damage, breaking off communication as well. I sent her a bunch of texts after the last time I heard from her. I was like, get inside now. Maddie Hersey says that she's desperate to find her boss, Diane Summers, who stopped responding to text messages after Hersey warning Summers a storm was coming her way. I don't know. I'm just nervous. I'm really nervous. I'm just hoping they're in a shelter and everything's fine. Now, Mexico's government urgently working to reestablish communication, bringing in more than 900 workers to address the damage. And here's the climate connection. That stunningly fast spin up happened in part because of this patch of ocean temperatures at 88 degrees, which is 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit above average. Absolute super fuel for a hurricane. We are in El Nino, so we anticipated that we'd have warmer waters in the Pacific. But as our climate and oceans warm, climate scientists are telling us to expect fewer hurricanes, but when they do happen, they will rapidly intensify because humans, we've really just added some steroids to nature. The world is baffled at the events taking place in the weather, and yet it was foretold 2,000 years ago in Bible prophecy that this would happen. Satan, the great deceiver, often tries to front-run God by giving people wrong ideas ahead of time about what is prophesied to happen. Satan has tricked mankind into believing that climate change is real and in turn has blinded many people to the gospel of Jesus Christ as we read in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age is blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7, and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Climate change is simply Satan's counter to Jesus' signs of his return and the end of the age. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, 
You had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Don't let Satan blind you to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The extreme weather the world has been witnessing is not climate change. It is God letting us know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is returning. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.